In my previous two videos, I argued that the usual arguments for common descent based on similarities between organisms and the fossil record are unsuccessful. These videos were intended to show that there is really no evolution to explain. However, even if there was, is there a viable mechanism that could accomplish this grand evolutionary story? According to Neo-Darwinism, natural selection acting on random mutations is all that is needed to explain the complexity and diversity of living organisms. But is this really enough? How much change can really be accomplished? New evidence is showing us that Neo-Darwinism is very limited in what it can actually do. So limited, in fact, that it cannot be the full explanation for the development of life on Earth. Virtually everyone agrees that natural selection can and does cause changes within existing species. What we need in order for evolution to be taken seriously is evidence that it can do more than that. The Neo-Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting on random mutations must be able to create fundamentally new genetic information so as to build all of the complex biological organisms we observe in nature. Evolutionists have given us several examples that they claim demonstrate that mutation and selection can indeed achieve this level of change. One example is the experiments with fruit flies. By directing mutations, scientists have been able to create fruit flies with four wings rather than two. This is hailed as evidence for the creative power of Darwinian evolution. However, it needs to be stressed that new information was not created in these experiments, as the flies already had the information necessary to build wings. Furthermore, the extra pair of wings proved to be detrimental to the flies. The flies had no muscles attached to the wings, making them useless. Additionally, the flies were unable to mate and therefore unable to pass on their genes. So four-winged fruit flies are an evolutionary dead end. Finally, even when a rare positive mutation does occur, it is difficult for this change to become fixed into a population. Lester and Boland sum this up by saying, Mutations, remember, are mistakes, sometimes referred to as copying errors, analogous to errors in the retyping of a manuscript. One does not add constructive sentences, paragraphs, or chapters to a complete book by the selective addition of random copying errors. Is it therefore reasonable to expect evolutionary novelty to arise in living creatures by slow accumulation of point mutations? The only things we've been able to find that natural selection explains are things that were never especially controversial in the first place. Natural selection can explain variations in the distribution of genes, for instance, in an already existing population. We have no evidence that natural selection has the power to create fundamentally new structures and new organisms. That's what it needs to be able to explain if it's going to do as advertised. There seems to be an inherent limit to how much something can be evolved. The beaks of Galapagos finches, for example, can fluctuate within a certain range of sizes and shapes. However, the finches cannot be changed beyond these boundaries. There is an edge to evolution. A further problem related to this is the problem of embryonic lethals. In order for a mutation to affect the body structure of an organism, it must happen in the early stages of embryonic development. Mutations taking place in the mid or late stages cannot affect the body structure. The problem is that early mutations are inevitably lethal to the embryo, meaning that it dies and so cannot pass on the mutation. Therefore, mutations cannot be the cause of new body structures. This is a serious problem to any theory of evolution that says mutations are the primary way that organisms change. As Stephen Meyer puts it, the kinds of mutations that do occur early lethal mutations or late acting mutations that affect only small clusters of somatic cells don't generate new body plans. How then could the evolutionary process overcome this difficulty to produce major changes in animal form? Mainstream evolutionary biologists have not answered this question. Some have claimed that recent experiments with bacteria that developed the ability to eat nylon prove evolution, since the ability to consume nylon was a product of mutations. But this claim is problematic. There are cousin enzymes of the nylon-eating bacteria that have weak nylonase activity. This activity can be converted into full activity by just two mutations, so we're not observing the creation of a new function, but rather the optimization of a pre-existing function. Perhaps the most famous experiments that are supposed to demonstrate the creative power of Darwin's theory of evolution come from the work of Richard Lenski. 
Lenski has been growing thousands of generations of E. coli bacteria in the laboratory since the 1990s. This long-term experiment has yielded some interesting results. For example, some bacteria are able to reproduce faster. Does this give evidence for the creative power of mutation and natural selection? No, because nothing fundamentally new has been added to the system. The bacteria already had the ability to reproduce. Additionally, newer studies reveal that the ability to reproduce faster was caused by mutations that caused a net loss of genetic information. Large chunks of DNA were deleted, and the bacteria lost the ability to metabolize ribose. Consider the illustration of a car. If your goal is to drive as fast as possible, then it may be beneficial to toss out parts of the car that are not necessary for the car to move faster, such as the spare tire, the back seat, or the doors. However, the advantage is gained at the cost of a greater loss. This is what happened with the E. coli bacteria. As Michael Behe says, after 50,000 generations of the most detailed definitive evolution experiment ever conducted, it's very likely that all of the beneficial mutations worked by degrading or outright breaking the respective ancestor genes, and the havoc wreaked by random mutation had been frozen in place by natural selection. With the failure of neo-Darwinism becoming apparent, many have sought relief in the extended evolutionary synthesis. This refers to a collection of theories that acknowledge the failure of neo-Darwinism, but try to add causes to it that can accomplish more than mutations can. Versions include evolutionary developmental biology, self-organization theories, neutral theory of evolution, neo-Lamarckian epigenetic inheritance, and natural genetic engineering. It exceeds the purposes of this video to examine each theory in detail, but I will respond to a newer theory of evolution that is becoming popular called process structuralism. This theory basically postulates that law-like self-organizational processes give rise to biological forms, which are then preserved through natural selection. Hence, structuralism differs from neo-Darwinism by hypothesizing that life as we see it was the inevitable result of front-loaded natural laws rather than random mutations. But can self-organization really account for life? Are there self-organizational processes that can create the information in DNA the way we can account for a snowflake? There are good reasons to be skeptical of this. First of all, laws don't cause things. Natural laws are descriptions of the way nature operates. But the laws don't actually cause anything. Perhaps proponents of structuralism mean natural forces rather than natural laws. But even then, that's too vague they have to give us some empirical data that such forces actually exist and are plausibly responsible for life. Second, natural laws are just the wrong sort of thing in principle to explain the information necessary to build animals. Laws describe regular, repeatable, and predictable patterns in nature. However, information by the nature of what it is is just the opposite. Information is irregular. That is what makes it informative. Stephen Meyer drives this point home. Laws describe, by definition, highly regular phenomena or structures, ones that possess what information theorists refer to as redundant order. On the other hand, the arrangements of matter in an information-rich text, including the genetic instructions on DNA, possess a high degree of complexity, or aperiodicity, not redundant order. Informative sequences have the qualitative feature of complexity, and thus are qualitatively distinguishable from systems categorized by periodic order that natural laws describe or generate. To say that the processes that natural laws describe can generate functionally specified informational sequences is, therefore, essentially a contradiction in terms. Laws are the wrong kind of entities to generate the informational features of life. Third, even if it were demonstrated that such laws exist, this would only be one possible way life could have developed. But we would still have to ask if there was any empirical evidence that this is actually the way it happened. As we saw in our last video, the fossil record is still empirical evidence against this view, since we see a very polyphyletic view of life rather than a monophyletic view. In summary, the arguments for the creative power of the evolutionary mechanisms are riddled with problems. These shortcomings leave the arguments unconvincing at best, and newer evolutionary mechanisms are also problematic. This suggests that natural forces cannot account for the complexity we see in the natural world. However, we know of another explanation that can, intelligent design.